Good evening, Tazy Far. Hopefully you all are having a good night tonight. This is Writing on Air. Writing on Air is made possible by the generous contributions of Casey Far's supporters and by Grocery Outlet of Chico. Independent owner and operator Chris Hostetler, Hostetler, excuse me if I'm saying that wrong, offers local and fine brand names in groceries, housewares, and health and beauty products. Grocery Outlet also has organic items, fine wines, and more. Open 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday on weekends from 8 a.m. till 9 p.m. at 2157 Pillsbury Road next to Kmart in Chico. Find them on Facebook and at GroceryOutlet.com. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, We are having a part two show today, um, which for those of you who follow the Facebook would have known that because I posted on there. Um, We have Joe Murphy with us today. How are you doing, Joe? Pretty good. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. And uh, tonight, Natalie is sitting out. She's tag teamed in with Brandon. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Uh, Let's try this one more time. Say it again, Brandon. Have they swapped the mic cables? Maybe. Hello? I can hear you now. We're going to say it's working. Test one, two. Test one, two. Check. I can hear you fine. So, again, how was your night? (laughs) Doing doing just fine. Glad to be back for another show. Yeah. It's been uh, a little while since we've had Brandon on here. Probably like four-ish weeks, maybe two or three shows, I think. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. You might be on the next show, too. Possibly. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. Cool. Well, uh... Huh? We can only hope. We can only hope is the is the answer for that. Well, uh, we have uh, Joe's book, Elegy of the Shade, with us again today. I'm really stoked about this. Um, tell us a little bit about your book. But before that, because I'm all crazy and turned about, I'm going to read your bio, because I think that's important. Go for it. <laughs> J.L. Murphy was born in the mountains of California, and upon finding fiction, began writing at a very young age, becoming obsessed with the make-believe. He began poorly illustrating several several stapled together stories that were not much more than monster tales. Ever since Murphy scribbled those first words, he found out that he could not and would not stop putting pen to paper. Over the years, he had written three different manuscripts, focusing on creating organic characters that grew and progressed through vivid worlds and complex histories. Murphy's debut novel, Elegy of the Shade, is also the first book of a four-part series based in the post-apocalyptic world of A Burnt Paradise. Other works of his include a variety of short stories, standalone novellas, and massive epic fantasy series that is slowly being fleshed out. He intends to release all of these projects as fast as he can write them. And when he says as fast as he can write them, he means it. Because you were talking to us last time about you wrote this one um, like after work or during work breaks, I think. Uh, oh, well, uh, work breaks, uh, after work. Anytime you could. Hey, but any given spare Man. moment, especially when I just didn't sleep, then I just really, really push out yeah, the pages. Yeah, free time at that point. Oh, uh, completely, you know. Well, well, t- other people go out and, you know, go for a jog. I'd hey, like, you're making... I get lost inside of a world that's terrifying. Making art? I mean, I suppose so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's what they tell me it is, but... <laughs> <laughs> tell us about your book. Uh, well, it is a uh, sci-fi, uh, a science fiction novel, I suppose, but in all reality, is a it is a uh, post-apocalyptic science fiction novel that has a lot of supernatural themes, and it follows the story of Thomas Riley, who is a deadly shade for the enigmatic Karen the Boatman. He poses as an investigator for a private firm, and he leads a nihilistic life of hedonism, uh, with death lurking around every corner. Uh, his very first memory are this pair of blue eyes, uh, and it's always served as this uh, sense of solace and comfort to him, and it's how he's always found peace doing what he does. Uh, in the story itself, he discovers uh, some very condemning and very terrifying secrets about the ministry of the city he, li- he lives in, the ministry being the government. And so his tale slowly spirals out of control, and he ends out interacting with all the denizens of the wastes in the world of a burnt paradise. And uh, you get to meet a lot of really, uh, oh, wow, um, really yeah. poignant characters. His fellow main character, Eliza Moore, uh, being his, not just his counterpart, but really his guiding force through this uh, very dangerous world as they uncover the secrets that wild uh, journey he stumbles upon man and i think uh last time you had mentioned too so i'll pull it out of you a little bit that this is also a bit of a love story um yeah absolutely uh the big one is i don't want to spoil anything for anyone right. but it is uh as much as it is a uh, a a very uh brutal world and as much as there is uh suffering and there's violence and there's narcotics and there's slaving and all these really harsh subjects uh there is a romance story in it and it's a it's what 
every single plot line within the book always comes back to is how these two interact with each other, how the romance itself is the act of compassion and kindness, which is why the world is as stark, bleak, and frankly, uh, brutal as it is. Yeah. So that when they do interact and you do get to see those moments, you get to see that humanity because that's something we each have in us. And I thought that was a very important plot piece to have because yeah. otherwise it's just a big yeah, you know, book with guns. You might as yeah. well just go watch Mad Max and you'll something have like a that. fine time. Yeah. I uh, think I mentioned last time too, I enjoyed um, that juxtaposition. I haven't read the book, but we talked a lot about it um, more on the previous show. Do tune into that one if you haven't, if you hadn't uh, listened to that yet. And um, I agreed. I think that juxtaposition really shows um, a nice kind of outline of humanity. So, I mean, that's the goal, of course. It, you know, read I, the book I, and find out for yourself. It's reading it, right, and right. then you know you can make that call yourself. Yes. So I know you have a little bit of a snippet for us tonight. Yeah, I have one snippet for you guys. Absolutely. Why don't we dive into that now? You got it. <clears throat> Eliza looks at the bulls and seems to realize what is in front of her and smiles. I will never forget this smile. It is a different woman I am seeing, not the dutiful and fierce moor. The smells and garnishes of Sayuri's broth seems to awaken someone else in her, a woman who doesn't need to be fierce. Smelling the dark broth, she lets out a content sigh. Incredible. Riley, I don't know how you found this place. A fell ramen chef. Who would have ever thought it? She worries the scar on the back of her hand as her eyes gently study mine. I feel an emotional agony tear through my being at the soft look. Thank you for making me see it. I take a slurping bite of the egg noodles and find myself letting out a laugh as I wash down the ramen with sake. The broth is working its magic on my fatigue after my fight with Nathaniel. I'm only happy to be here with Eliza. Sayori is smiling as Allie hops up to sit on the bar next to me. What do you mean, Eliza? I mean, the food is amazing, don't get me wrong. I just thought you would want something in your stomach before tomorrow, and I needed it. The mark tends to drain me of energy. I'll be sleeping like the dead after this. She shakes her head as she signals Shinji for water. The food is amazing, but this after this week, I guess I was struggling to see the good in us. I'm having to break protocol with the security council for tomorrow and everything else. She looks thoughtfully at me through the vapors that drift from her food. I guess this just helped remind me of what we can do, that there is nobility in it. Nobility? I ask. Allie hops off the bar with a happy hum to go spinning down the street behind me as I think of Jacob, Nathaniel's bizarre hunter's honor, and the masses of naive worship around us. After what we've both seen, I'm finding it hard to agree. She rolls her eyes with a light laugh, scarred fingers running over the clay body of her bowl. Of course he would. Look. She motions her chopsticks towards where Sayuri watches us with glittering eyes. These people made this shack out of what they could, despite everything arrayed against them. She points to Sayuri's large pot as Shinji brings her a chip mug of water. She raises it over her bowl in salute to Sayuri. Out of the dust and bitterness, they per persevered and made a life. I think back to the dark hole where we left Jacob, of Nathaniel's insane willpower, and the girl who deserves more. Humanity also did that. It turned the sky to fire and forced itself into devouring the fingers from its own hand. Are we noble? Or just maddened with our own inability to fully disappear as so much else has? I study her dark hair shining and her pale skin almost glowing. I glower at my chopsticks. That's what humanity does more. It is too stubborn to die, even though that is the inevitable of it all. No action we take seems to benefit us. We continue to cut off our own flesh in some insane hope that we'll find more life beneath. My words are dark, and the ramen suddenly doesn't melt on my tongue as it has in the past. She looks at me, the sounds of Narion's filling the air between us. A small smile, the one that has stuck with me since the gala, graces her lips. You're wrong, Thomas. The despondent darkness retreats at the smile. I catch Sayori nodding to herself as she wipes down the counter. Yet my defiance can't let our discourse just end on Eliza's word. Oh, am I more? 
They are born and then they die. That is the eternal struggle and cycle. She sighs. Her hand touches the chipped rim of the ramen bowl as she swallows a mouthful of broth and points her chopsticks at me. You're not wrong there, but out of that inevitable, they continue their lives. And though any of them, you or I, could simply lay down and let the ash take us, we do not. And they do not now, Thomas. That is the nobility that I speak of, the simplicity of the candid act of living. Despite their deaths, they persevere, stubbornly attempting to create something from what little they have. She says as her hand settles on the counter, two fingers settling softly on mine, her small smile driving away the pain of her rejection. I am almost lost in her eyes, her words chiming with the idealist within me, and I feel something fundamental at my core change. Her blue eyes glitter as her hand leaves mine. That is why we protect them, even from themselves, so that they may have that simplicity, so that they can continue. Now, she says, her chopsticks gri gripped, <coughs> gripping a steaming bunch of delicious wavy noodles. Enough with the philosophy. I'm starving. Go ahead, Brennan. He's smiling from ear to ear at this there, point. There, there's just so much to break down there. Uh. I, I mean, I, to be clear, I purposely chose a passage uh, that doesn't display the more uh, gritty, yes, uh, yeah, dark yeah. bits, but more the philosophy and kind of that compassion that I was talking about. Yeah. And it's a very important scene because it's the scene where Thomas realizes that, like, wow, I adore this woman. Like, what? Who are you? Yeah, I was going to say, I was, I was taking some notes while you're reading on that. And I love... Um, Whenever I read books or, or watch TV or anything, I love philosophical discussions, especially within the characters, um, within the stories. And this one was such, it was a brilliant piece on, on humanity, uh, a discussion of humanity and why they're protecting humanity within just a simple ramen shop in the middle of this wasteland, which was awesome. Like to me, I'm, I love settings. All these things mean, and mean things and have values. And watching just this discussion happen over something very simple, just like a, a bowl of soup essentially, yeah. is beautiful. That was that was a phenomenal. I'm glad you chose this piece for that because it was great. It's one of my uh, favorite that I've, that I've ever written, mostly because when I originally wrote that scene, I didn't know what was happening. I was just kind of writing them going back and forth. And then all of a sudden this weird philosophy bit kind of started up. And then Eliza just kind of stole the show she just kind of rolled with it and after editing it got cut down to the length it is now it was about two pages longer before but uh as th those two characters go that's pretty much how they operate it is wonderfully condensed and i think and i don't take this wrong way i find it simple perfectly it's just it says exactly what it needs to say and nothing more, and then it goes right back to the food, which is beautiful to me. When I watched, when I was listening to that, um, I got this picture of just kind of what food does to people in the situation. Like they're here to share a meal, and that opens you up a little bit, which is what makes that cool, like love interest. Um, I guess a neat dynamic for this this particular uh, piece because you can you can feel it at the the kind of the edges of that like oh there's there's a whiff of something there like the vapors and the noodles mm -hmm. that you said in that but it's not the core of what's happening you're discussing the whole plot line the theory behind why they're doing what they're doing in the thing which if you read the book you'll find out more about the whole discussion of that absolutely um, part of the reason why I actually chose that passage is because there's a lot of phrases and terms that uh, you just as the listener won't be familiar with unless yes. you read the book such as the fell or some sounds things and they're yeah. yeah, different uh, characters nathaniel the girl who deserves yeah. more which is a very tragic character yeah and uh i also wanted to say too because a lot of times we get submissions from people and they um for whatever reason can't make a, a live show or um it just doesn't work out so we we usually have to read them ourselves and i love doing that but there are there's been many times where i've read something and the author will will come back to me or, or the person who's wrote the piece or composed the piece and they're like yeah that was great kind of wish you had touched on this though but great job great job and like oh i'm sorry and so hearing the author read his own work um was perfect because you had nuance in there and emphasis on certain things that i would not have known to emphasis or emphasize and that's cool to me so hopefully as a listener as you picked up on that there was parts where you kind of gave more weighted more and and that's part of the fun for me of being on the show so thanks for that because that was cool yeah no, yeah of, of course from i a, actually would very much so like to do an audiobook 
report, which yeah. I will probably be doing here in the next couple months. I listen. I'll read it and listen. That'd Mostly be awesome. because every single character has their own voice, and you can't. Yeah, yeah. And I'm an eccentric weirdo where I'm like, ah, but I'd have to coach you, whatever voice you actor it. on. Yeah, yeah. What accents those are. I think it's important. If you want the full depth of the story, like you sometimes have to hear it from the person who gave birth to it, you know? Oh, absolutely. I think it's uh, kind of imperative if you're going to try and do that for someone's work. Yes, yeah. You get uh, a lot more detail, in my opinion. You miss a lot if you don't do that. So that was cool. So I was going to ask, too, um, as far as, like, world building goes, uh, because I think we had talked about it a little bit at the end of the show last time that we wanted to talk more about how you develop this entire thing. Um, So I just was going to start with a question. What was the hardest part for you to, I guess, put in development in this world? Was there like mechanics between the characters or was it difficult to start just the plot? Like what, what was the most challenging for you? Um, It could be all together. (laughs) That's, yeah, that's a really, that's a really layered question. Which part was the most difficult, Joseph? Uh, Yeah, I put you on the spot, so no worries. uh, Well, the reality is, uh, when I started writing it, the two characters, just Thomas and Eliza being who they were, really made the plot that has developed this four book series. Like them being who they are, the more I discovered about them, the more I found out about the wastes because all of a sudden it was like well i need to know where they're running around what what is this city state like what are these towns like um i think the most i'm not going to say difficult but uh time consuming was actually writing out the 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 53 year history because it is set 53 years after the fall give or take no one's entirely sure Uh, which is important for the story obviously very uh there's a whole note that gives you the updated calendar and what have you which is Extensive again neurotic animation. world builder it's my well, it's well, my thing well, i have well, to well I, w- I was gonna ask how do you build your world did you write yourself your own simarillion and it's like this is the uh, this is the, the way codex. the world works oh. and then we're gonna go and write the story or is that in your head where did you just start with a city and it just developed on its own and to uh, let you think on that for a second the reason why we're asking this because we haven't had um or at least to the best of my knowledge, as Brandon was talking about about this beforehand, we haven't had a novelist on here uh, who's written a novel, so we're trying to pull out as much from you as we can. Yeah, absolutely. So. I, I this is my this yeah. is my bread and butter. Let's do it. Let's cool, cool. Get right, let's get right into it. What was it uh, last time? Uh, buckle up, Buttercup. Yes, that was there it. we go. Buckle that was up, it. Buttercup. All right. yep. But um, in all reality, the story actually started with chapter one, and chapter one was this really poorly written short story about this guy smoking and drinking whiskey, and he throws a guy off a roof. And it, it wasn't really good, but I uh, had been going through a really hard time uh, when I started writing a second chapter to that short story. Uh, and then it just slowly kept building and building. So when I first started it, I had no idea it was even post-apocalyptic. The story really made itself. It's why every time I go back to write in it, I really feel like... I'm only returning to find out what everyone in the waste is doing. Like, oh, what, what's uh, you know, what's Ulysses Homer Hackett doing in the city state of Brim today? Like, what's what's he up to? Oh, something awful, probably. Like, it's, it's times are tough. I get it. I right. get it. Um, but to answer your question, um, when it comes to like that Cimmerillion style, that that index of knowledge. It was over halfway through book one that I realized I had to detail out the entire 53-year history. So on top of writing book one, I wrote a 25,000-word 53-year history, which is not fully detailed. It's just major events and things, just so that when I'm writing the books and uh, the, the history of the Waste is constantly referenced by characters. So it's one of those things that I go back to all the time to make sure it's keeping up with uh consistency yeah consistency to make sure it all lines up but through doing that i i'm not going to spoil anything but i found out like who the big antagonists in the story are like the the people who you'll get to read about in this book and the following books who are really just pawns or results of these actual antagonists so in this world there's uh there, there, it just became incredibly complex, and it 
uh, I, I won't lie, it became a little daunting because it was like, how do I somehow delve into all this information but not overwhelm a reader with all that kind of exposition? Because you're not just going to have a character walk up to the main character and be like, hey there. So I realize you don't know what the Ashfall War is, so I'm going to tell you in a 10-page essay about how the city of Kingston was formed. It, like it, it doesn't quite work that way. So I had to figure out ways to... Um, introduce these historical points gently organically yeah. into the story which really yeah. just actually now that i think about it, it wasn't that difficult because it just kind of conversations happens. yeah yeah well, would you say that writing that nice twenty five thousand page <laughs> co codex for yourself kind of yeah, helped you fle flesh out the world for yourself so that it actually made writing after that easier because you're like oh yeah this is over here and oh completely it, it's it it does this thing and it's shaped like this and one hundred percent. It ma it made it uh, it made it not only easier just geographically speaking, but it made it so that every single character that comes into the story, uh, it's like, well, where were they during this this war that was being waged four years ago, or maybe the one that was happening twelve years before that? Like, where were they at that time? Because they're the wastes are not a peaceful place. It's a very, very hard, hard time in humanity's history. Uh, so it, that that uh, that companion guide has really, really uh, it, it made my life easier writing the books after book one. Yeah, book one was really the I have no idea what's going on Shooting here. I was head. I was along for the ride. Like as much as the readers will be like, oh, I'm getting to discover all these things. Me too. Just, no, I, I was there like, yeah, I have no idea what's happening next. I'd love to know where Thomas and Eliza are taking me because I have a plot I need them to do and they're not doing it currently. So, <laughs> great. All right, so it sounds like you don't plan your plot. Do you have, like, general points you want your characters to hit, like major events you know that they need to be at but you don't know the road or do you just like this is where they last were let's see where they're going to end up um well generally speaking i'll know the end of a novel but the way i try and keep uh my writing process very specifically with the characters is that they're not characters they're people so when i go into it every chapter will have something that needs to happen in it i just don't know how they're going to get to that one thing because every single chapter has some kind of plot piece that will get them further towards the end of the book so that then I can start working on the next one. But when it comes to uh, just kind of letting them go, I I have had to take steps in the past to make Thomas and Eliza kind of, you know, get back on task. So uh, you'll be reading scenes where they'll, they'll be having like a philosophical discussion about books and a character just randomly shows up and is like hey you guys have like a thing you wanted to talk to me that was me as the author being like okay guys like look this has yeah, been this stop. has been fun this has been all puppies and rainbows but we got we got in a post-apocalyptic wasteland to save yeah. okay like get moving oh my god you're a railroad DM. <laughs> um i i had to i mean at that point i had to it was i didn't have a choice <laughs> You know, yep. they're sitting there talking about, you know, the existential meaning behind a book. And I'd love to explain to you yes. where that came out of my head outside of, well, at the time, the immense amount of narcotics I was doing. But, you know, it was a, it is a very fun scene. So, you know, you'll see that happen occasionally in the book. And if you do notice any of these weird little moments of characters suddenly being like, hey, what's up? That was me as the author being like, okay, I, I actually need you guys to go do the, the, the story. Like, you guys have a thing you need to go do. You have a job. <laughs> like, look, I created you. I can fire you. So, right, you know, right. let's. R.R. Martin is checked on that one. He's yeah. like, oh, yeah, I created. I can destroy. I, I kind of feel like R.R. Martin just kind of, like, looks at his characters and goes, I can't wait for people to love you. Yep. <laughs> That's, that's and then you're gonna die. I'm just you're you're gone. Buckle up. <laughs> um, I mean, for myself, I uh, I never kill characters unless it is uh, not absolutely necessary, but makes it sense. fits. Yes, makes sense. And a part of that is uh, book three is when um, certain things happen. Say, yes, some very heavy stuff happens, and one of these things is war. And in war, in battle there is no assurance that you're going to make it out. Right. So people and characters that you become accustomed to over book one and two will die. And it's not me striking out at the readers. It's 
war is an awful chaotic thing happens. and there's no you know there's no way you can be like oh i'm gonna make it through this because of course everyone going into it, it's like oh i'm gonna make it through this and well you're in a wasteland you don't. yeah it's a much more interesting story when you don't have plot armor <laughs> Oh, as completely. good as plot armor is. I mean, to be honest, I uh, it was only last week that I figured out the ending to book three. So it was a very interesting learning moment where I was like, oh, wow. So that's how it's going down. Okay. Wow. Love to know what the beginning of book four is. Like, we're going to find <laughs> that one out too, I guess. Thomas, Eliza, stop talking. Let's go. We got work to do. Well, we're reaching the end of our program, unfortunately, because I, I do wish this was longer because, man, there's so much we could dive into. So I'll pose a last question and answer it however you will. Um, and it kind of in the theme of as towards, uh, I guess, for advice for new writers. But what was your favorite um, character to develop and why? Oh, uh, in book one, uh, my favorite character to develop was Nathaniel Rise. Okay. Um, as much as Thomas and Eliza are both uh, the main characters in the plot and over the entire thing, uh, the side characters, the minor characters who really have very huge roles in the story who seem so irrelevant, he was the one that I really, really loved getting into his head. And uh, he's only in two chapters, but he was he became the epitome of humanity for me because he is he is. You know, he's ruthless, he's brutal, yet he has this code of honor where it's like, you know, you could have killed me, but you didn't. And I respect that. And then he shows this level of compassion towards these people who have been abducted, you know, where he's like, you know, that's not all right. And it, he became this weird, uh, I guess, this, this euphemism for uh, humanity in my head where he's not supposed to be some positive glowing review of it for the record, but that was probably one of my favorite characters to develop. And when you're writing characters, I think the big thing to remember as a writer and as the author, as the person who's making these uh, worlds and these people is that they are exactly that, they're people. And it's your job, it's, your, it's really your duty when you pick up the pen and put it to paper to make sure that even these minor ones, even the ones who might not ever show up again after a chapter, make them feel real. And if you need to go out and listen to how people talk and maybe go study accents so that you can see how you can write and make that accent in a uh, word. Or write a codex for your history. So. Uh, well, you know, or do that. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> Oh, or, or I would. Does, you know, well, I take does, that back. Does, Absolutely does, do that. Does, that. does that mean there will be a fifth companion book to the series? Um, actually, once uh, the four book series is released, uh, I will be releasing the, uh, it's going to be called the Lexicon Stygia. That will make sense once you read the books. Right. But uh, yeah, that's it will be released someday. It just It's every spoiler you could have. <laughs> so it's like, oh, yeah, that's yeah. got to so, wait. So that one's got to hold off a little bit. So that definitely last. <laughs> So, last and easiest question, where can we find your book? Uh, Amazon.com. You can find it underneath my author page of JL Murphy, or you can find it uh, just as a product listed under Elegy of the Shade. Wonderful. Anything else we should know about you? Uh, Shout you know, outs I like or... uh, long walks on the beach, and uh, I enjoy some bluegrass at times. I'll put some nice music to background that. Fantastic. Bluegrass music. Uh, thank you again for having me. Dude, this was awesome. We'll have to have you back. There's there's so much more we can explore in this book. Let's I'm ready for it. I am more than ready for a part three. Right on. Well, this has been Writing on Air. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. And Writing on Air is made possible by the generous contributions of KZVR supporters and by Harrison Daily Wright Accountancy Corporation in Chico. Harrison Daily Wright specializing in accounting and bookkeeping services, auditing, tax preparation, planning, and management support services for nonprofit organizations and more. To reach Harrison Daily Wright, call 895-1209. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>